Welcome to Asset Repositioning for Small PHAs, an illustration of major program tools. My name is Greg Byrne. I'll be your instructor or narrator today. I'm a director of the Transaction Division for the Office of Recapitalization, which oversees the Rental Assistance Demonstration Program. This presentation is part of a series of videos, webinars, and other program guidance offered by HUD to assist public housing agencies, PHAs, with repositioning their public housing. This training lasts about 75 minutes. We're going to be covering a lot of topics, so please feel free to pause this video at any time to replay any topic and just generally to go at your own pace. Today's training is targeted to PHAs with between 51 and 250 public housing units. A similar video has been prepared specifically for medium and large PHAs who have very different organizational characteristics and have different program requirements and flexibilities. We'll also be providing separate instruction for very small PHAs with those with 50 or fewer units. A written text of this presentation is available at www.radresource.net. The goal of this training is not to cover the very detailed instructions on the very various programmatic requirements associated with each conversion option. We will not, for example, review the precise submission requirements for a Section 18 disposition application. Rather, the goal is to sketch out the available HUD options small PHAs have to reposition their public housing, as well as how those tools can be used in combination. The idea is to provide a general overview of the different repositioning options. At the end of the presentation, we will share links of where more detailed guidance can be found. This training is divided into three parts, this introduction, then a review of conversion options, and then a case study. Viewers who are familiar with the conversion options can choose to skip or skim the conversion options section and go directly to the case study. This training is intended for any PHA staff who might be involved in repositioning planning. However, we also encourage PHA leadership to share this video as appropriate with board members and other local stakeholders. For this training, we will look at the fictitious Sutton Housing Authority, or SHA. SHA is a total of 230 public housing units, but also administers a 300-unit voucher program. We'll talk more about SHA shortly. Admittedly, this hypothetical PHA is a little busier than the standard small PHA in terms of the number of sites or special characteristics, but we wanted to be able to demonstrate the range of tools and situations that a very small PHA may face with repositioning. When we use the term public housing repositioning, we mean removing a project from the public housing program and placing it under the Section 8 Housing Assistance Program. We also refer to it as a conversion, as in converting from the public housing program to the Section 8 program. Now, repositioning or conversion can often involve or be coupled with a recapitalization of a property. For example, PHA may choose to convert a project to the Section 8 program and simultaneously take out a new first mortgage to pay for needed repairs. But in other situations, a PHA may decide on a two-step process where the project first converts to Section 8 but undertakes a larger recapitalization event at a later time. Therefore, while one of the main goals of repositioning is to make it easier for a project to raise proceeds to meet physical needs, such a refinancing does not necessarily have to occur at the same time as the project converts, with the caveat that at least under RAD, a PHA must at least meet the capital needs identified in a third-party physical needs assessment. Before we examine more why a PHA would want to convert to Section 8, let's take a moment to review what programmatically distinguishes public housing from Section 8. So what is public housing? The public housing program was created with the Housing Act of 1937 to meet the housing needs of low-income households. Today there are about 1 million public housing units across the country administered by some 
3,000 local PHAs. PHAs enter into an annual contributions contract, or ACC, with HUD, but the ACC has no funding guarantee or even agreed upon funding levels. Initially, the federal government paid the debt service on the bonds that financed the construction of public housing, and PHAs used tenant rents to cover operating expenses. Over time, as operating costs increased, as buildings aged, and as tenant incomes, and therefore rents decreased, the Congress introduced various attempts to help subsidize the operating costs and capital repairs to public housing. Today, there are two main public housing funding programs, the Operating Fund Program and the Capital Fund Program. Amounts under each are awarded based on formulas and are subject to annual congressional appropriations, meaning they can go up or down in any year. In 2019, the Congress appropriated $4.7 billion for the Operating Fund Program and $2.8 billion for the Capital Fund Program. In addition, PHAs collected about $3.4 billion in tenant rents for total public housing funding of about $10.9 billion in 2019. PHAs also execute a use restriction, usually called a Declaration of Trust, or DOT, which ensures that the project is used for low-income housing. This DOT also restricts the PHA from placing any encumbrance or debt on public housing property without HUD approval. Although the DOT doesn't necessarily prevent a PHA from leveraging a public housing property, such as securing a mortgage, as long as it attains HUD approval, it's more the case that the public housing program was never conceived to rely on private debt and equity. Consequently, as will be described shortly, public housing's various program structures really aren't conducive to private financing. So what is Section 8? Let's look at the Section 8 program. In 1974, after more than a decade of experimenting with different means of encouraging private ownership and development of low-income housing, that is, alternatives to the public ownership of public housing, the Congress created the Section 8 program, adding a new Section 8 to the Housing Act in 1937. It was the first true deep subsidy program wherein HUD would make up the difference between an approved contract rent to the owner and the rent that the low-income households would pay. There were actually two Section 8 programs that Congress created. The first was Section 8 vouchers, called certificates back then, where Tenants would find housing on the private market. Today, there are about 2.2 million vouchers in circulation nationally. The second was Section 8 project-based rental assistance, or what we refer to as PBRA, where the Section 8 subsidies were attached to specific buildings or developments. Today, there are about 1.2 million PBRA units, although that number has come down over the years as long-term Section 8 contracts expired and some owners chose to opt out and not renew. Initially, PBRA was the only project-based Section 8 program, but then in 1998, Congress authorized the Project-Based Voucher, or PBV, program, allowing PHAs to use up to 20% of their voucher authority for project-based vouchers, or PBVs. Today, there are around 200,000 PBV units nationwide, or about 10% of the voucher inventory. This new PBV program, however, also came with some restrictions not present in the PBRA program, most notably that, one, not more than 25% of the units in a project could be project-based, with exceptions for elderly, scattered sites, or units receiving supportive service, and two, all tenants after one year were given the option to move with the first available voucher, what's been called choice mobility. Now, later in 2016, Congress eased some of these restrictions, including eliminating the income mixing requirement for PBV projects considered previously assisted, which would include public housing conversions. One of the key program differences, then, between Section 8 and public housing is the availability of long-term housing assistance payment contracts, or HAP contracts, with built-in rent adjustments. These contract provisions have been essential to lenders in underwriting a project. Nothing remotely like it exists in public housing. In public housing, there's really no such thing as a contract rent. There's no long-term subsidy contract, and there's no automatic rent adjustment factor, all of which make 
mortgage lending difficult. So why convert? Why would a PHA want to convert? So, Although conversion to Section 8 is entirely voluntary, the department believes that the Section 8 program can be a better vehicle for the long-term preservation of property that was developed under the public housing program. The reasons for this are mostly threefold. First, Section 8 is a more reliable and stable funding platform. And in some conversions, as will be demonstrated later in the presentation, the rents may actually be higher than in public housing. Second, Section 8 provides PHAs with a better ability to attract or leverage private debt, such as a first mortgage, as well as equity, as in low-income housing tax credits, to take care of backlog capital needs and also to ensure adequate reserves for future replacements of systems and equipment. And third, the Section 8 program, from a regulatory perspective, is generally considered simpler to run and administer, which should help lower operating costs. Again, conversion is entirely voluntary, and a PHA can decide to convert one or all of its public housing assets. However, we generally advise PHAs to think of converting, if possible, all of their units so they can consolidate operations. It's much easier to administer an agency operating only one housing subsidy program than two or more. Hence, when we get to the case study, we will assume that the PHA is trying to find a way or a path to convert all of its units to Section 8, not just one of its properties. Obviously, full conversion will be an easier exercise to accomplish the smaller the PHA's public housing inventory or the fewer the number of properties. In this section, we're going to review the four main options for getting public housing onto the Section 8 platform. They are the Rental Assistance Demonstration Program, or RAD, Section 18, Demolition and Disposition, Streamline Voluntary Conversion, or SVC, and Section 32, Home Ownership. We're going to spend a few minutes running through each of these programs, but as a brief summary, as shown in the diagram, a PHA first can convert under RAD to either PBRA or PVD, or it can convert under Section 18, receive Section 8 Tenant Protection Vouchers, TPVs, and then either project base those TPVs or issue the TPVs to residents to rent housing in the private market. PHA, however, cannot, under Section 18, convert to PBRA. Only RAD can convert to PBRA. Third, a PHA can convert under streamlined voluntary conversion, receive TPVs, and then either project base the TPVs, but with tenant consent, or issue the TPVs to the residents to rent housing in the private market. And like Section 18, there's no PBRA option under streamlined voluntary conversion. Streamlined voluntary conversion is available to any PHA with 250 or fewer public housing units. And lastly, a PHA could convert units to low-income home ownership under Section 32, wherein HUD will provide TPVs as replacement housing for that community as units are sold off. Now, for more of the specifics on each program, uh, we'll start with RAD. In 2011, Congress authorized the RAD program, which allows PHAs to convert their public housing to Section 8 assistance. With subsequent congressional authorizations, HUD now has the authority to convert 455,000 public housing units to the Section 8. To date, some 130,000 units have already converted, proving that converting to Section 8 really is an effective means of attracting private capital to preserve public housing. RAD is known as a no-cost or no-new funding program. The Congress did not appropriate any additional funds for RAD. Instead, a PHA combines its current operating fund with its capital fund amounts by project and then adds this combined subsidy now called a housing assistance payment to the tenant rents to create the Section 8 contract rent. Let's look at an example of how this works. The top bar on the chart on the screen shows the current public housing funding for a hypothetical public housing project. Here the tenant rents in purple are 318, the operating subsidies in light blue are 330, and capital funds in orange are 144, all expressed in per unit monthly amounts, or PUMs. 
combined, those amounts add to 792. Under RAD, the project will leave or be removed from the public housing program and will have a Section 8 contract rent of the same amount, 792. The operating fund and capital fund get replaced with Section 8 housing assistance payments, shown in yellow. The project will also enter into a long-term HAP contract, which provides annual rent adjustments and it will execute a RAD use agreement, which ensures that the property is maintained as low-income housing. As with other Section 8 contracts, if tenant rents go down in any year, the HAP subsidy goes up, and if the tenant rents rise, the HAP subsidy goes down. What then is the significance of converting public housing rents and subsidies into a Section 8 contract rent? Why does it really matter? The primary advantage is that these Section 8 contract rents and the long-term contracts facilitate lending. The public housing program doesn't have the equivalent of a contract rent. Yes, a PHA collects tenant rents, which represent about one-third nationally of the PHA's budget, but then a PHA also receives, under separate program rules and calculations, operating subsidies and capital subsidies. So, therefore, there's not a specific contract rent in public housing, which means that a PHA can't easily sit down with a lender and assess a project's rental income. Public housing project's income is more nebulous and not as reliable as a Section 8 contract rent. Moreover, the public housing funding levels fluctuate from year to year, whereas in Section 8, there's a long-term assistance contract with built-in adjustments for inflation. That's huge. It's hard for a lender to get sufficiently comfortable with the public housing funding system, no less understand it, to commit to long-term mortgage capital. On the other hand, lenders understand how to finance and how to refinance Section 8 housing. Under RAD, a PHA has the option of converting to two forms of long-term project-based Section 8 assistance. First, there's PBRA, or Project-Based Rental Assistance. This program is administered by HUD's Office of Multifamily Housing. As mentioned earlier, it was the first Section 8 project-based program created by Congress. is also by far the largest or PBDs, project-based vouchers. This is the newer alternative form of project-based Section 8 authorized by Congress in 1998. It's a component of the voucher program. Here, a local voucher agency is the contract administrator, and the Office of Public and Indian Housing oversees the voucher agency, but is not a direct administrator of the PBD contract. Additionally, if a PHA does not operate a voucher program, it will need to partner with a current voucher agency to administer the PBDs. Although we generally talk about RAD rents equal to current funding, there are some RAD rent caps. If a PHA is converting to PBRA and the RAD rents exceed 120% of the FMR, which is very rare, the PHA must provide a rent comparability study to support those rents up to 150% of the FMR. And if the PHA is converting to PBD, the RAD rents can never exceed the lower of the reasonable rent or 110% of the FMR, which is just the basic PBD rent rules. Other key features of RAD include, first, RAD is a preservation program. How, hence, it has a requirement for one-for-one -one replacement with exceptions for certain de minimis reductions. Two, under RAD, the converted project must be owned or controlled by a public or nonprofit entity, which could take the form of direct PHA ownership or often, in the case of tax credits, a long-term ground lease with the tax credit partnership. Three, residents also have an absolute right to return, including any households that today might be over income. Four, RAD requires long-term HAP contracts and use agreements which HUD must offer to renew and which the PHA must accept, essentially creating low-income housing in perpetuity. Five, RAD also allows the PHA to transfer the assistance, what is called a TOA, to another site or property if such transfer is in the best interest of the PHA and residents. And uh, six, RAD allows a PHA to bundle rents across properties to facilitate conversion for Example, 
rent bundling allows a PHA to reduce rents of the project with lower needs and increase rents of the project with higher needs. In terms of transaction processing, under RAD, a PHA applies it's through a very simple online application and then gets awarded a CHAP, or a commitment to enter into a housing assistance payment contract. PHA then has nine months with opportunities for extensions to submit a financing plan. As part of that financing plan, the PHA must obtain a third-party capital needs assessment, or CNA, that looks at both existing needs and needs over the next 20 years with streamlined CNA requirements for certain classes of properties, such as projects recently constructed or being financed with low-income housing tax credits. Before a PHA can actually submit a financing plan, it must first request a concept call, wherein it explains how it plans to address the capital needs over the 20 years, whether through annual replacement reserve deposits or through upfront sources, such as mortgage proceeds or public housing funds or tax credit equity. It is then invited to submit the financing plan, which, once approved, results in the issuance of a RAD conversion commitment, or RCC, allowing the PHA to convert or close and, if needed, to begin rehab. Upon closing, the property is removed from public housing, thereby releasing it from the declaration of trust. A RAD use agreement is executed and recorded, and the PHA enters into a long-term HAP contract. At that moment, it has converted. Now, just a note to say that some PHAs may demonstrate that they can meet the 20-year capital needs through just, say, simply setting aside a large annual deposit reserves, or what we refer to as a no-debt deal. Indeed, some PHAs will convert but still plan to undertake a larger recapitalization in a few years. Under RAD, that's fine. PHA just needs to show us that it can meet all, identif all items identified in the capital needs assessment. And if the PHA wants to do more work down the road, that's up to them. The next conversion option is the Section 18 program, referring to Section 18 of the Housing Act of 1937, which governs the demolition and disposition of public housing. It was created in 1998. Prior to that time, a PHA had to replace every public housing unit demolished or disposed with a hard unit. This one-for-one -one replacement proved challenging and therefore resulted in lots of severely distressed properties stuck in a state of limbo with no funds to adequately restore them, but the PHA being prevented from removing it. Section 18 eliminates the one-for-one -one requirement, provided that the project meets certain criteria. Before we get to that criteria, let's talk about what happens when you get approved for Section 18. First, unless a PHA simply wants to demolish the structure and retain title, it must actually dispose of the asset. Now, it can either sell the property at fair market value, in which case the proceeds must be used for public housing or Section 8 purposes, or it can dispose of the units for less than fair market value for a commensurate public benefit, which generally means the provision of housing for low-income households. Very often, PHAs will dispose of Section 18 properties to a nonprofit arm of the PHA and then redevelop the property as affordable housing. Second, with its Section 18 approval, a PHA gets Section 8 Tenant Protection Vouchers, or TPVs, for every unit that has been occupied within 24 months of the Section 18 approval. Subject to appropriations, HUD essentially makes the community whole in terms of the number of assisted housing units, replacing those lost public housing units with vouchers. Now, in some cases, the property is in such poor condition that a PHA is happy just to rid itself of the property via demolition or disposition. But other times, particularly when the property is removed for non-obsolescence reasons, PHAs are able to project-base the TPVs to salvage or preserve the buildings. And the PDV rents may be higher than what the PHA was getting under the public housing program. Because remember, the rents will be based on what HUD would pay under the voucher program, not the public housing program. There are six basic criteria under Section 18, and these are outlined in PIH Notice 2018-04. The 
first is obsolescence. To meet the obsolescence test, the property must have existing capital needs, including those projected over the next three years, equal to 57.14% of HUD's total development costs, or TDCs, for non-elevated structures, and 62.5% for elevated structures. In other words, the property must evidence quite poor physical conditions. And health and safety. A project can also qualify for Section 18 if it presents clear health and safety risks to tenants that cannot reasonably be abated, such as a property located adjacent to a large electrical transformer station that emits loud noise disturbances. Next criterion is scattered sites. A PHA can remove any scattered site units that are operationally unsustainable. Indeed, for most PHAs, scattered sites have proven hard to maintain effectively, especially at public housing funding levels. For the purposes of Section 18, a scattered site is defined as any non-contiguous property with four or fewer units. For example, the picture shown on the left would meet this definition of scattered site, but the picture on the right would not. The next criterion is called 50 or fewer public housing units. The PHA only has only 50 or fewer units, or when a larger PHA gets down to its last 50 public housing units, it is automatically eligible to remove those last 50 units via Section 18, including combined RAD and Section 18 transactions that involve the last public housing units. For example, if a PHA has 70 remaining public housing units, it could, as long as it was part of one transaction, convert 20 units to RAD and remove the remaining 50 units via Section 18. Next criterion is called RAD Section 18 Blend. HUD allows PHAs to substitute 25% of the units in a RAD transaction for Section 18 with accompanying TPVs, provided the transaction is undertaking substantial rehab and provided the project is not being financed with 9% credits. The rehab hard costs must equal or exceed 60% of HUD's housing construction costs, or called HCC, for the type of units involved, or what works out to 36% of TDC. And lastly, the last um, Section 18 criterion is called efficient and effective. Um, it's when a PHA can demonstrate that Removal of the units can result in the creation of more efficient and effective housing without any test of obsolescence. However, HUD will only provide TPVs for 25% of the units. So the actual number of units that the PHA will create is negotiated between the PHA and HUD on a case-by-case -case basis. So, for example, assume that a PHA is a generally undesirable 100-unit project but the project doesn't qualify for physical obsolescence. The PHA would like to tear it down and build 50 units in its place. Because the property is not obsolete, HUD will only issue the agency 25 TPVs, or 25% of the units. And the, in this case, the PHA will contribute 25% of its own local vouchers, which it will project base, but then will only be replacing 50 units in total. Not many PHAs, therefore, have pursued this criterion. It's usually saved for an asset that a PHA finds very undesirable that does not, though, meet the obsolescence test, but where the PHA will be willing to remove it, even when HUD will only provide TPVs for 25% of the units. The third major repositioning option is Streamlined Voluntary Conversion, or SVC. And 1998, Congress added Section 22 to the Housing Act of 1937, allowing any PHA to replace public housing with vouchers whenever it could demonstrate that it was cheaper to give each family a voucher than is voluntary conversion. However, the associated methodology and cost test has proven extremely challenging for small PHAs to master. Hence, in early 2019, PIH issued a notice, PIH Notice 2019-05, providing for a streamlined approval for voluntary conversion applicable to PHAs with 250 or fewer units where it waived the cost test. 
As with Section 18, under streamlined voluntary conversion, a PJ receives a TPD for each unit occupied during the past 24 months since HUD's Section 22 approval. If the subject property following conversion will continue as rental housing, the PHA must offer the TVDs to the residents to rent in place. But a PHA can also project base the TVDs provided it obtains tenant consent. Otherwise, the PHA must provide the TPDs to the residents. Streamlined voluntary conversion is available for any PHA with 250 or fewer units. The final main repositioning option for PHAs is Section 32, Home Ownership, which refers to Section 32 of the Housing Act of 1937. It allows a PHA to sell public housing units to low-income households based on a PHA-adopted home ownership plan. Section 32 is actually a quite flexible program, other than the basic program requirement that the purchasers must be low income. The PHA largely determines program eligibility and other participation requirements. Any sale proceeds generated must be used for public housing or Section 8 purposes. And any units sold that were occupied in the past 24 months will receive a Section 8 TPD. Of course, not all, and in fact, few public housing projects make good home ownership projects. Uh, PHA, for example, is not likely to convert a mid-rise family project to home ownership or even a senior high-rise. But scattered sites, on the other hand, might be something worth considering if a PHA has interest in a home ownership program. But it's also the case that a PHA could do home ownership under Section 18. For instance, a, a PHA were interested in converting scattered sites to home ownership, the PHA could also qualify for Section 18 under scattered sites and then create its own home ownership program outside of Section 32. Although Section 32 is a path to Section 8 TPDs, it's not a path to project-based Section 8 since obviously the units are being sold off as home ownership. Let's go over the master repositioning chart one more time to summarize where we are in terms of conversion options. First, under RAD, a PHA can convert to Section 8 PDRA or PDD. However, it will be capped at current funding, which is converted to a RAD contract rent. But there's no required disposition of the asset and no requirement for tenant consent. Of course, resident consultation is required under RAD, as it is for all repositioning options. Under Section 18, if a project qualifies, the PHA will be eligible for TPDs for all units occupied in the past 24 months, which if feasible, the PHA can elect to project base without any tenant consent. But the PHA must also dispose of the property, which it could do by disposing to a nonprofit subsidiary, sometimes called an instrumentality or affiliate of the PHA. Under streamlined voluntary conversion, a PHA with 250 or fewer units can, can remove the units from public housing and will receive a TPD for any unit occupied in the past 24 months. No disposition is required. However, if the PHA wants to project base the TBDs on the converting units, tenant consent is required. And lastly, under Section 32, a PHA can sell units under a home ownership program for low-income households in which HUD will make available Section 8 TPDs as replacement housing. Now, before we move to our case study, we need to review five more program rules or requirements that can greatly affect repositioning planning. The first have to do with the PDD rent rules. Under the PDD program, rents are set according to the lowest of the rent requested by the owner, 110% of the FMR adjusted by any utility allowances for the project, and the reasonable rent for the unit. The above rules have two major implications in repositioning planning. First. In the case of conversions under Section 18 or Streamlined Voluntary Conversion, the TBD rents, meaning the rent that would project would command if the TBDs were project-based, can potentially be higher than the RAD rents. That's because the RAD rents are based on current public housing funding levels, whereas the non-RAD PBD rents are based on FMRs and rent reasonableness. In areas where FMRs that are higher than public housing funding, the PHA may be better off financially by converting to Section 18 or Streamlined Voluntary Conversion than if they 
converted under RAD if they are eligible. Second, the opposite can occur, which is where the public housing funding is actually higher than the market rents. In these cases, the RAD rents will be capped by market, because remember, under the PDD program, an owner never gets more than the market or reasonable rent. When this happens, the PHA may want to consider converting to RAD PDRA, where a PHA is allowed to keep the current funding as long as it does not exceed 120% of the FMR, which happens infrequently. Next, fair phase-out funding. Under the public housing program, a PHA is eligible for certain phase-out or phase-down funding of the operating fund or capital fund, depending on the method of removal. First, there's DDTF funding. DDTF stands for Demolition Disposition Transition Funding. Under DDTF, a PHA is eligible for five additional years of capital funding whenever a unit is removed through Section 18, but not through RAD or Streamline Logic Version. And there's ARF funding. ARF stands for Asset Repositioning Fee. Under ARF, a PHA is eligible for three years of reduced operating funds whenever a unit is removed through a Section 18 demo action and two years for a disposition action. No ARF funds are available under RAD or Streamline Voluntary Conversion. And we also have Faircloth Authority. 1999, Congress added a provision that prohibits a PHA from building public housing units in excess of then current levels, named after the legislation's sponsor, Senator Locke Faircloth of North Carolina. When a PHA removes units from public housing through either streamlined voluntary conversion or Section 18, it retains that fair cloth authority, meaning that it has the authority to return those units to the public housing program if it ever finds a way to get the units built. Although, technically, a PHA that repositions through streamlined voluntary conversion can only transfer that fair cloth authority to another PHA before closeout. A PHA does not keep its fair cloth authority if it converts to RAD based on the reasoning that these units have already been replaced under RAD. Public housing operating reserves. At, at conversion, RAD is the only program that allows a PHA to convey its operating reserves to the converted project, using them either as a development budget source or as a reserve for the converted project or both. The RAD legislation included specific language authorizing the use of public housing funds to, to facilitate conversion. But for Section 18 or streamlined voluntary conversion, a PHA cannot use its reserves, say, to fund a reserve account for the converting project. Under Section 18 or streamlined voluntary conversion actions, those operating reserves must, prior to close out of the public housing program, either be spent down or transferred to another PHA. Otherwise, they will be returned to Treasury. And then over-income households. From time to time, PHAs may have families that moved into public housing who obviously were income eligible, but now have seen their incomes increase such that they would not be eligible if they applied anew. In the RAD statute, the Congress specifically grandfathered existing public housing tenants. All existing tenants have a guaranteed right to return, even if at conversion, they might otherwise be over income for the Section 8 program. That special legislative provision doesn't exist when a public housing authority converts via Section 18 or streamlined voluntary conversion. A PHA could have some households who are over income and would not be eligible to receive a Section 8 unit. In these circumstances, a PHA may either want to convert to RAD to ensure the tenant's right to remain or the PHA will need to find other ways of accommodating the household with comparable assisted housing, generally for a period of three years, such as allowing the family to remain in their unit at their current rent levels. Now let's see how all this plays out via a case study. As indicated earlier, our case study PHA is called the Sutton Housing Authority, or SHA. SHA has five properties. At this stage in the PHA's planning efforts, it has not yet undertaken a comprehensive physical needs assessment of each property. So the physical description that follows is based on SHA's own knowledge of its properties, which is typical of where most PHAs will be starting off as they begin repositioning planning. We'll begin with Abbott Heights. It's a 
three-story senior property of 80 units with an elevator that was built in 1972. It's never been renovated and as a result needs moderate to major rehab. It also has 10 households who today are paying a public housing flat rent and would be over income for the Section 8 program. Remember, Rad's grandfather provision would allow these units to remain under a HAP contract, but that would not be the case under Section 18 or Streamlined Voluntary Conversion. The next is du north side duplexes. This includes a total of 30 units in 15 duplex buildings that were constructed in the late 1980s. These 15 buildings are on separate, non-contiguous sites. They are in fair condition, but a challenge to operate. Renaissance Homes is a 60-unit property that was built under the Public Housing Mixed Finance Program in 2002 and is in good condition but needs some updating or refreshing. When SHA built these mixed finance units, it also created a nonprofit subsidiary called Sutton Affordable Housing, or SAH, which is the controlling general partner of the owner entity. Village Square consists of 40 quadruplex units, or 10 buildings, on one site arranged around a cul-de-sac. SHA fully renovated these units in 2012 with ARA stimulus funds and is in, therefore in very good condition. And the last property is West Lawn Gardens. It's a 20-unit low-rise general occupancy property that was built in 1964 and is in very poor physical condition. The property was built on the side of a hill and there are a host of structural problems that cannot be readily corrected. The property also has an existing energy performance contract, or EPC, from 2015, which has another 10 years and 150,000 in principal outstanding. For ease of illustration, we're going to assume that the Section 18 or Streamlined Voluntary Conversion Rents, that is the rent that each project would command if they project-based the TPVs, would be on the order of $150 PUM higher than the RAD rents. This means that all else being equal, SHA would prefer conversion under Section 18 over RAD if it can find a way to qualify for Section 18. So in total, SHA has five properties and 230 public housing units. For ease of instructions, we're also going to take some liberties in introducing the following assumptions or additional summary information. First, the agency also owns a parcel of land, approximately five acres, that remains from a 50-unit project that they demolished in 2019 called Cary Village. The land is assessed at 30,000 an acre. It's located in a non-minority impacted area where the city is also building a new magnet school. As a result of this demolition of Cary Village, the PHA has 50 unused fair cloth units and has five years of future DDTF funding estimated at 120,000 a year or 600,000 total. Also because of the demolition of Cary Village, the PHA is receiving the first of three years of our funding, asset repositioning fee, in which in total is estimated at 325000 And the agency has 857000 in public housing operating reserves, which amounts to 3500 a unit, or somewhat typical for an agency of size. And finally, as a reminder, SHA also administers a 300-unit voucher program. So Collectively, the above, along with the five properties, represents the assets of the PHA. As with any PHA preparing to embark on a repositioning exercise, we have to understand what SHA's underlying goals are. What is the PHA attempting to accomplish with repositioning? In this case, and remembering that this will be different from PHA to PHA, the SHA's main goal is to preserve as many hard units as feasible. It is not interested in simply vouchering out. However, for its most distressed property, West Lawn Gardens, if there is no reasonable plan either to preserve the units or create new replacement units, it would be willing to have the site demolished and the residents issued TPVs in order for those families to get better housing 
and in order to better stabilize the neighborhood. It is also not interested in home ownership, even though the north side duplexes might otherwise be a good candidate. Now, in terms of secondary goals, the SHA would like to maintain via any preservation option control of the asset and not seek to transfer the asset to another PHA or nonprofit or other mission-oriented ownership entity. It would also like to avoid any staff reductions, although the primary goal is the preservation of long-term affordable housing. We prefer not to undertake any action that might affect current staffing. We would also like to find a vehicle to preserve each unit that would not require the additional complication of having to obtain tenant consent to project-based the assistance. Thus, while SHA would be eligible for streamlined voluntary conversion, it would prefer to find another conversion option, either RAD or Section 18, than streamlined voluntary conversion. And lastly, the agency would like to convert everything to Section 8 and get everything on one subsidy platform, if feasible. With the stage now set, let's look at the options. The first place to begin is to scan SHA's portfolio to see if there are any obvious solutions or answers to their portfolio goals. So are there? Well, the most obvious candidate is north side duplexes, which appears to qualify under Section 18 as scattered sites. The units are challenging to operate, particularly at the public housing funding levels, and they consist of four or fewer units on non-contiguous sites. Now, although the SHA could just sell the units at fair market value, we would like to retain the units in its portfolio as long-term assisted housing. In time, we would like to take out a mortgage on these units to undertake some needed recapitalization, but it feels that, for now, the higher Section 8 funding will help stabilize the units and hold them over until they are ready to more formally refinance. For these scattered site units to comply with Section 18, SHA will need to dispose of the units. Well, the PHA created a nonprofit subsidiary back when it built its mixed finance project, the Sutton Affordable Housing, or SAH. So it will dispose of the scattered sites for, say, a dollar to SAH, which is permitted under the commensurate public benefit provision since the units will be used as affordable housing. Also, in order for the units to be placed under a Section 8 HAP contract, units must substantially meet the voucher program's housing quality standards, or HQS. In this case, the units are not in deteriorated condition. The PHA has identified some immediate repairs that it will undertake, but nothing significant and nothing that would prevent it from passing HQS. And Moreover, this strategy doesn't require any relocation of tenants, and also all tenants meet the Section 18, the Section 8 eligibility requirements. Because this property is being removed through Section 18, it will also receive both DDTF and R funds, and it will be able to retain its faircloth units. So one down with four more to go. Next, we'll turn to Renaissance Homes. This recently completed mixed finance property is a great candidate for RAD. Because the property is in good physical condition, it should easily be able to convert at the RAD rents. In fact, the property might even be able to donate under rent bundling some of its rents to a property with higher capital needs. Because it will convert via RAD, it will not be eligible for DDTF or, or Faircloth. And so for now, we'll just set it aside then as a straight RAD conversion. The next property we'll examine is Abbott Heights. This property needs substantial rehab, but at least from the PHA's understanding of repair needs, it would not meet Section 18's obsolescence test, which would be 62.5% of TDC for an elevator building. Abbott Heights also has the 10 households who would be over income for Section 8, and thus the PHA could not put those units under a HAP contract under any repositioning option other than RAD. Let's try to run through the traditional Section 18 options. It, it's not obsolete. There's no urgent health and safety issues. It's not scattered sites. And SHA is interested in preserving as many units as possible, so the Section 18 efficient, effective option is not of any interest to it because HUD would only provide 25% replacement vouchers. And it's 
also not the last 50 units in the agency's inventory. Consequently, the most likely conversion option for this property would either be 100% RAD or RAD Section 18 blend with 75% of the units as RAD and 25% of the units as Section 18 with the higher rents on the Section 18 units. To qualify, the PHA would need to undertake repairs of at least 36% of TDC or 60% of HCC without relying on 9% credits. Finally, FHA will need to prepare some additional feasibility analyses, but based on the experience of other RAD transactions from around the country, this property appears to fit the profile of a property that could be financed with 4% low-income housing tax credits. And by converting to RAD, the PHA can solve the issue of the over-income households. If it pursued this path, it would likely consider developing the project using its nonprofit affiliate, the SHA as the developer owner. We'll put down now at least that Abbott Heights will convert under either standard RAD or RAD Section 18 blend with the 60 units converting under RAD and 20 under Section 18. At 80 units, it should be large enough to be attractive to lenders and investors as a standalone 4% tax credit project, but the PHA might also want to think about possibly combining it with one or another property to make it even more enticing to lenders and investors, uh, that is, to create a better economy of scale. By converting via the RAD Section 18 blend, it would only be eligible for ARF, DDTF, or Faircloth for the 20 units that would be removed through Section 18. At this stage, we've really had no heavy lifting. The choices have been pretty logical or feasible. We've had three properties totaling 170 units that have a strategy, although we haven't necessarily firmed up all the financing sources, but we think we're on the right path in those cases. That leaves us with two properties remaining, West Lawn Gardens and Village Square, representing a total of 60 units. West Lawn Gardens includes 20 very deteriorated units on a bad site. Although SHA doesn't yet have an independent physical needs assessment for West Lawn Gardens, or really for any property, SHA feels reasonably certain that the project will qualify under obsolescence with capital needs exceeding 57.14% of TDC. In that case, it would be eligible for Section 18 TPVs for all units occupied in the past 24 months. And despite the fact that the property is distressed, the SHA has been able to keep it fully occupied, which means that it would receive TPVs for each unit. Unlike Abbott Heights, West Lawn Gardens is really not a candidate for rehab, even at the higher TPV rents. And the topography of the site doesn't lend itself to rebuilding. Ideally, the site should be raised. In fact, an abutting owner has indicated interest in the property as an apple orchard, but the property really has only modest value. The question is whether the PHA can build replacement units elsewhere, and how would it do that? PHA could go RAD and try to transfer the assistance either to a new construction site, say the vacant land at the former Cary Village, or to some other existing property, or maybe even an owner of a tax credit project that would like to have 20 deep subsidy units. But the rents would be less than if the PHA went Section 18 and got TPVs. So most likely, then, the preferred option would be to go Section 18 with the higher rents. Now, if the PHA wanted to hold those TPVs for the new construction units, it would either need to stage the removal so that families are relocated only once, which is when the new units are built, or the PHA would need to find other vacant units throughout its stock to move current residents and then bank the TPVs for future development uh, if that were the preference of the tenants. If SHA decided to replace these 20 hard units as opposed to simply vouchering out, it would likely need to seek additional capital beyond what either the RAD rents or the TPV, TPV rents would support the first mortgage proceeds to make the deal work, you know, such as CDBG funds or home funds or a grant under the Federal Home Loan Bank's Affordable Housing Program or some combination thereof. Or it will need to secure 9% low-income housing tax credits, which are extremely competitive. Anyway, at this stage of the planning process, it's probably best to consider disposing the property for fair market value under Section 18 obsolescence, but with 
more due diligence needed before the agency decides whether it has a reasonable chance of replacing these hard units or whether it should just simply voucher out the property with the Section 18 TPVs. However, remember that West Lawn Gardens also has an EPC with 150000 in principal that it will most likely need to pay off at conversion, probably through either sale proceeds of selling the land or using the agency's own existing public housing reserves. The PHA removes the units through Section 18 and will receive ARF, DDTF, and will retain Faircloth authority. Through the previous action, the, the agency is now actually down to its last 50 units, the 40 units at Village Square, which were fully renovated just a few years ago. Of course, SHA could have chosen other strategies that would have left other projects as the last to be removed, but at least at this first pass at things, Village Square is eligible for the Section 18, 50, and fewer criterion. It can then receive TPVs for these units and project base them back on the property without any tenant consent, but it would need to dispose of the units, which most likely it would do to its nonprofit subsidiary, SAH. If Village Square were not the last 50 units remaining, the property would likely also have been an easy candidate for RAD, given the solid condition of the property. Hence, Depending on what changes the PHA might make in its second iteration of a portfolio plan, it could switch this out, in which case it might also be able to rent bundle with other properties. Now, if it goes Section 18, 50 and fewer, it will receive ARF, DDTF, and retain Faircloth. So there we have it. We've got the makings of an initial portfolio strategy with plans for each property that would eventually close out SHA's public housing program and convert to Section 8. So for north side duplexes, we said that the most logical option is Section 18 scattered sites with project basing the TPVs back on site. Abbott Heights, either RAD or RAD Section 18 blend. Renaissance Homes, the mixed finance project, RAD. West Gardens, the very distressed property, the Section 18 obsolescence most likely with issuing the family's TPVs to, uh, to relocate. The Village Square, because you're down to your last 50 units, Section 18, 50 and under, where the PHA then project bases those TPVs. We still have a few other things to clean up. Remember, there was the future DDTF funds for Cary Village. The, PHA has some 600,000 in future DDTF funds that are due it as a result of the 2019 demolition of Cary Village. Obviously, it doesn't want to lose these funds. The best choice would be to use them to increase the rents at Abbott Heights. So under RAD, a PHA can trade in future DDTF funds for a contract rent boost, which in this case, around $42 PUM increase in the rents for the 60 units at Abbott Heights that would be converting to RAD, assuming the remaining 20 units convert to Section 18 under the RAD Section 18 blend. This boost is calculated by taking the 600000 in future GDTF funds, dividing by 20 years of the HAP contract, dividing by 60 units, and then dividing by 12 months in a year. It also has 857000 in operating reserves. Once the PHA closes out its public housing program, it, it can't take its reserves with it. But SHA is still a long way from closing out its inventory. So by the time it works through, the, say, the first half of its portfolio, more of these reserves will have been spent on, say, RAD deals. But eventually, if the PHA gets down to its last project, it will want to plan on how to use these reserves before it actually closes everything out. And the vacant land from the demolition of Cary Village, remember, the land is valued at 150000 in total, but, and it's still under a declaration of trust. So the PHA has several options here. First, depending on the budgets or the development budgets for the other properties, I mean, SHA might just need to sell this land to fill a gap in funding, 
which provided the units were either converted to RAD or PBV would be an eligible use of disposition funds. Second, it could dispose of the site for less than fair market value if the disposed property were used to support affordable housing, such as if there was a local developer who was interested in doing some mixed income affordable housing on the property. Or third, it could also, the site could be used for the future home of the replacement units from West Lawn Gardens if the PHA were able to secure other outside funding and hopefully in some mixed income setting. And then it has the 50 units of Faircloth Authority because PHA will be closing out its public housing program under Section 18, 50 and fewer when it finally gets down to removing Village Square. It can't use any more, it can't use its Faircloth Authority when it closes out. So it either has to have already rebuilt units or uh, it will, it can transfer this authority to another PHA upon closeout. And in fact, it can even barter for some asset, asset of equal value from the um, trading agency. ARF funding, the PHA is estimated to receive 325,000 ARF funding over the next three years for Cary Village. These funds are likely to help the PHA scale down uh, its operations, uh, but probably are not likely to be a source that can be relied upon as a large development source, unlike, say, DDTF. Now, remember also that the PHA will be eligible for new ARF and DDTF funds, as well as retention of Faircloth Authority for any units that it removes through Section 18, including any RAD Section 18 blend, just for the units removed through Section 18. And lastly, SHA also operates that 300 unit voucher program. Consequently, it will serve as the voucher administrator for any units that it converts to PVVs. Moreover, Wherever the PHA project bases the assistance back on site, these projects, because they would be considered previously assisted, would be exempt from the voucher program cap on the number of voucher units that can be project based. The PHA will, however, need to find an independent entity to perform the HQS inspections and the annual determination of rent reasonableness. Now, if the PHA had not operated the voucher program, it would have needed to find an existing voucher agency to serve as its contract administrator. Now that we've put all our cards on the table, let's see how well we did vis-a-vis -vis the SHA's five repositioning goals. For the most part, we've been able to preserve all units with the exception of the 20 units at West Lawn Gardens. Now, SHA might be able to find replacement units, but it also said it was willing to let them go given their poor condition. PHA is also maintaining control of all assets, either directly through the PHA's ownership or through its nonprofit SAH. And other than losing the 20 units at Westlawn, there's really nothing in this plan that should really have any implication on staffing. And finally, it's found a way to full conversion without having to go through tenant consent for project basing the assistance. This case study was intended simply to illustrate the kinds of repositioning options available to small PHAs. The PHA in question could have chosen different strategies from the ones we selected here. Indeed, asset repositioning planning is very much an iterative process requiring multiple passes and refinements as more data is collected and as goals and objectives are clarified. We know that all small PHAs automatically qualify for streamlined voluntary conversion. Any small PHA could voucher out its entire public housing program if that's in the best interest of the PHA and its residents. That's available to all. But most small PHAs are likely to be looking to preserve existing units and at least preserve the project-based subsidy to transfer the assistance or rebuild on site. Of course, Again, to help illustrate the range of options, we created a PHA with five separate properties lending themselves to different issues and challenges. There are many small PHAs with just one property. Hence, these PHAs will have a simpler exercise to undertake. But for those PHAs 
who have multiple properties, they will also need to decide about sequencing, whether to pull off conversion all at once or through a staged process. Clearly, though, the more advanced the PHA gets in its repositioning planning, the more important it will become to obtain a comprehensive physical needs assessment of each property. It's also essential to better understand the rents that each project would command under each conversion option. PHA should definitely seek appropriate professional guidance where needed. For simplicity, we also assumed for this case study that the Section 8 TPV rents would be higher, $150 PUM higher than the RAD rents. Indeed, in most markets around the country, that's the situation. But there are maybe 10 to 20 percent of PHAs where the RAD rents are actually higher than market. Remember, under the PDV program, you never can get more than the market or reasonable rent. In those circumstances, the PHA will want to give some thought to RAD PBRA, where the PHA can maintain current funding. What we've not done today is spend time thinking through some of the organizational issues surrounding conversion, including staff training or changes in IT systems as the PHA migrates to Section 8. We hope to address those topics in future training or videos. We hope that this training has better informed you of the possibilities for repositioning and the associated tools available. For more information, please also refer to the Office of Public and Indian Housing's repositioning website and the Office of Recapitalization's RAD resource desk. And finally, here are some tools that may help you assess your portfolio, which can also be found on the RAD resource desk. There's the file of two, 2018 RAD rents. This table includes HUD's calculation of RAD contract rents for each public housing property around the country, as well as the local FMRs for that project. There's the RAD conversion guide for public housing housing agency, which provides additional instructions on the many conversion requirements under RAD. And, and there's also the RAD inventory assessment tool, which is a spreadsheet that allows you to determine the maximum first mortgage potential for every public housing project in the country using various mortgage rates, loan periods, and other user-defined assumptions. Thank you again for your participation in this training. If you have questions, please feel free to email us at rad at hud.gov.